In the last two sessions, we talked about business level strategy. So these are strategies for a single product market focus. In today's session, we will cover corporate level strategies. So we will expand our focus to more than just one business, to a portfolio of businesses. And we will talk about diversification, reasons for diversification, as well as portfolio management. And we will end the session by looking at what does the stock market actually say about diversification. But before we do that, as usual, we have to start off with a definition. Corporate level strategy is an integrated and coordinated set of commitments and actions a firm takes to gain a competitive advantage by selecting and managing a group or a portfolio of different businesses competing in different product markets. At this point, I would also like to clarify a few terms. This uh, is an example of a value chain. So I took the example of the automotive supply chain here, starting from raw material production to part manufacturers, then to the car manufacturers, which are the brands like Mercedes or Toyota, to the distributors, the car importers, then the dealers, eventually going to the car buyers, to the, to the end consumer. Now, when we talk about integration at the same level of the supply chain, then we talk about horizontal integration. So this would be, for example, the merger between Daimler and Chrysler to Daimler Chrysler back in the 2000s, early 2000s. That would be a horizontal integration. We talk about vertical integration when we integrate along the supply chain. So, for example, um, a car manufacturer acquiring or merging with a supplier or the forward integration to taking over the dealership, for example, or um, the, the, the car importers. So just to clarify these terms. Next, we will talk about different levels of diversification. We start off with low levels of diversification. And here we have the single business, which we already know from the business level strategy. In this case, more than 95% or 95% or more of revenues come from one single business. An example for this would be Starbucks, which is basically um, the coffee chain business. A slightly higher level of diversification is when we have dominant business strategies, which means that 70 to 95% of revenues come from a single business, but there's also another business. So here in Thailand, we would have um, Carabao as an example uh, for this kind of level of diversification. Uh, Carabao has its brands, it's energy drinks, but it's also having a distribution business. So energy drinks in 2020 were about 82% of the uh, total business, the revenues, and the distribution business was sitting at 14%. And there were some other businesses involved as well. But um, of course, the energy drink business for Carabao was dominant. So that would be a dominant business diversification. Moving on to moderate to high levels of diversification, we have a level of diversification which is called related constraint diversification. In this case, it's less than 70% of revenues that comes from a single business, but all the businesses, all the business units share product linkages, technological linkages, or distribution linkages. So an example for this would be CP All, which has the convenience store business with 7-Eleven, and then a macro cash and carry. The split here is around 64% in, in 2019 um, for the convenience store business and 36% uh, for, for cash and carry. So about two thirds and one third. That would be related to constraint because both are retail businesses, obviously. Um, a slightly higher level of diversification is the related linked diversification. Here, less than 70% of revenues come from a single business. And there are some links, but only very limited links between the businesses. An example for this one would be Minor International or Mint here in Thailand, um, where about 60% of the business comes from hotels, 35% roughly comes from, from food, and uh, another 5% or so comes um, from the lifestyle business, which is the retail business. Between hotels, food, and the retail business, there are very limited links, close to none at all. 
And finally, we have very high levels of diversification. This is also called a conglomerate diversification, where the businesses have basically no common links um, with each other. An example for this one would be um, Siam Cement Group, which has a cement business, chemicals business, and a paper business. So apart from the fact that they are all um, kind of in the industrial sector, there's close to no linkage between those three businesses and therefore it's unrelated diversification. So why do businesses actually diversify? And does this diversification actually create value? This is, this is a big question, a big strategic question that we have to ask ourselves. So let's look at it. And I give you the, the big picture and the overview first. Um, there are basically based on research 11 or so reasons for diversification. And some of them are value creating, again, on average and based on research. Some of them are value neutral and some of them are value reducing. So what it means is if businesses, um, for example, diversify because of economies of scope, which is in the first group, then this diversification on average, based on the research, creates value. So looking at those one by one, the first group of, of reasons is value creating. And the first and foremost is economies of scope. So economies of scope is defined as cost savings that a firm creates by sharing some of its resources or by transferring competencies between the businesses. So examples of those activities are combining the purchasing power, for example, if two businesses have, have similar suppliers. Or it could also be a technology transfer between the different business units. And uh, examples for transferring core competencies could be if, if one uh, business unit does not need to develop their own resources, so we have capacity savings, or we transfer some intangible resources like knowledge or patents or something from one BU to the other, so that one BU gets competitive advantage over its rivals from that diversification or from, uh, from those economies of scope. So this, on average, if companies diversify for this reason, it creates value on average. The second reason that creates value is market power. So this is when a company diversifies to sell products at a price level above the competitors, or if it's able to reduce its cost below the competitor cost level. Um, one area where market power occurs is multi-point competition. So for example, when a company follows its competitors and competes in the same product markets or geographical areas as a competitor. So for example, if a competitor moves um, to Cambodia or to Laos, then we also do the same and we have multi-point competition. And therefore we keep the market power of the competitor in check and maybe expand our own market power. And here we also have to talk about vertical integration. So backward and forward integration as we just discussed. So backward integration if we absorb the supplier margin by producing our own input products in-house or forward integration by creating our own source of output by basically taking on the next step in the value chain. So all of these activities increase market power and as I said, on average, they create value. The last value creating reason is financial economies. Financial economies is defined as cost savings through improved allocation of financial resources. And that can come from basically uh, two sources. The first one is efficient internal capital market allocation. What does that mean? It means that when we invest in the outside market, in companies, uh, in the stock market, for example, in companies where we don't have full disclosure or for full information, then we run somehow blind. We are re reliant on the information that is provided to us. So we have a very limited information flow. Um, and we also have the same information as any competitor has. So therefore there is limited value creation. However, if we use the internal capital market, then we know exactly how each business unit is performing. 
so we can allocate our capital in the most efficient way to those business units and those areas that have the highest growth potential or the highest profit potential and can therefore get the best return on our capital. That's the efficient internal market, uh, capital market allocation. The other thing that occurs um, in, when companies look for financial economies is restructuring of assets. So for example, the, the, the private equity model, you buy a company, you restructure it, and you sell it off with a profit. We will talk more about this in the next session. So these are financial economies that can occur. And again, on average, they are value creating. Now, there's a number of reasons that is neither value creating nor value destroying. So basically value neutral. And the first one of these is antitrust regulation. So companies might diversify because they are forced to do that by law. So competition laws might prevent you from growing within your own industry. And therefore, all you can do is to look outside of your own industry if you want to, to grow. And uh, these, these antitrust laws typically foster conglomerate diversification because businesses are forced to look outside their own industry. Another reason for businesses to diversify sometimes is tax laws. So um, at, at two levels here, actually, from a, as a shareholder level, um, shareholders may actually prefer that companies reinvest into diversification or into other businesses because of personal tax reasons. If the company pays the excess cash in dividends, then this is subject to income tax in most countries. So shareholders might actually prefer that you reinvest that money in other companies or diversify the business um, because that share value increase is not a taxable event in most countries. The other reason is corporate tax. So if a company invests in new diversified assets, this may lead to higher depreciation allowance, and which is a non-cash flow expense and is tax deductible and um, might give the company financial benefit. Again, antitrust regulation and tax laws are both value neutral reasons. So on average, based on research, they do not add value to the business. Another one is low performance. So companies might diversify because um, their, their current performance is, is poor. So companies might hope to improve the overall performance of their business by diversifying. And based on research, you see here the, the chart and the reality is that it really depends on what type of diversification happens. On average, it's value neutral as discussed, but there's a higher chance to get benefit for the business if we are talking about a related constraint diversification. So where the businesses have strong linkages for unrelated diversification, the opportunity of benefit is quite a bit lower. Another reason is uncertain future cash flows and basically risk diversification. So diversifying into different types of businesses because of risk or risk management. So interesting enough, while this is a very frequent reason, this is also value neutral. So on average, companies don't create value when they follow um, a diversification strategy for this reason. So uncertain future cash flows, what does it mean? The core businesses might be subject to market movements. For example, in the oil and gas industry, it moves with the oil price. So um, you might aim to smooth the business volatility by um, diversifying the business. But again, on average, this is value neutral. Synergies is another reason to diversify or the synergies, um, the, the belief in synergies. Now, reality is that synergies are very, very hard to realize. Synergies occur if companies work together and by working together, the values uh, created is higher than the companies working independently. But again, the reality is um, it usually doesn't occur. So value neutral on average. And finally, the acquisition of tangible and intangible resources. So by diversifying into another business, um, to get benefit from the other businesses, tangible or intangible resources. Um, now, from my personal experience, unless 
the resources were underutilized previously, it's very hard to actually realize benefits across the businesses. Um, for example, the value created by, by sharing in one business unit often comes at the expense of the other business. So one business will benefit, the other business will get less attention or will be neglected. And therefore, on average, again, for the total business and for the combined business, this is value neutral. Now, there are also reasons that, on average, destroy value. Let's look at these. And uh, there's two, basically. One is diversifying managerial employment risk. So, from a management perspective, the larger the business is, the more growth opportunities or career opportunities exist within the business. And that increases the likelihood for any underperforming manager to find a new role within the same company. And it extends the lifetime, basically, of, of those underperforming managers. So no wonder that this strategy, if this is the reason for diversification, um, actually destroys value. And another one is increasing managerial compensation. Again, from a management perspective, any diversification, any acquisition or uh, enlargement of the business is very attractive. It's exciting and it gives opportunities for new roles, like, for example, board seats or increased span of control. And that comes typically with a higher level of compensation. So if this is the motivation for diversification, then again, on average, it destroys value. Now, let's look at some strategies on how to think about managing a portfolio. And the most famous tool or the most famous framework for doing this is the BCG matrix, the Boston Consulting Group matrix from the 1970s, 1980s. Uh, first, talking about portfolio management. So portfolio management is a method of first assessing the competitive position of a portfolio of businesses within the corpor corporation. So looking at how is each business performing. A second is suggesting strategic alternatives for each business. So based on the performance, what do we do with each business and how can each business move forward? And basically defining a business level strategy for each of these businesses. And then identifying priorities for the allocation of resources. Again, financial economies come to mind here of how to best allocate the internal capital to maximize the benefit and the profit for the business. So the Boston Consulting Group matrix works like this. On one axis, you have on the x-axis, you have the relative market share. And this is measured relative to the biggest competitor, to the largest competitor. So in the middle, at one, we would basically be as large as our largest competitor in size. At the very extreme, on the left side of the x-axis, it would be 10 times larger than the largest competitor. So a very dominant position. And uh, on the right side of the x-axis, it would be like one-tenth of the largest competitor. So relatively small um, compared to the dominant player. On the y-axis, we have market growth or industry growth. And this is just measured in percent. So in the middle, you have roughly 10% industry growth. And that ranges from 0 to 20%. The circles that you see here are the business units. So each circle represents one business, one product portfolio. And um, you see here the bigger ones make a bigger share of the total portfolio of the company, while the smaller ones are relatively unimportant, I would say, or small revenue shares for the company. So by looking at the different fields, um, for the stars, for example, these are the high growth businesses where we have a relatively strong market position, dominating market position over the next competitor. So these are the ones that we want to really push, where we want to invest capital and keep it growing. Then the cash cows in the bottom left are those where we have a really dominant market position, so bigger than the, the next largest competitor, um, but limited growth. So these are the areas where we would just like to maintain our market share, continue to grow the business at the low rates, and just, as the name of the field suggests, 
use this business as a cash cow to fund other ventures. Now, the dogs are businesses where most consultants and, and managers recommend to get out of the business. So basically to, to divest this kind of business because um, first of all, they have low market growth and we are a relatively small player. We have a, a giant competitor in the same industry. So the best thing is to get out of these kind of businesses. And the question marks, again, as the name suggests, are not so clear. So we see high market growth, but we are relatively small compared to competitors. So either we see the potential to grow, so we invest heavily and make sure that we maintain or, or retain in the end a strong market position, at least as big as the next competitor. So we move it towards the star area or if we are really a dwarf compared to the rest of the industry, then we better divest and move out. So this is one way of thinking about the pot managing the portfolio of the business by using the BCG matrix. Now, um, a way to look at the BCG matrix is also to look at it from a product life cycle perspective. So um, you see here the product life cycle over time with the X axis and the sales, uh, the, the volume um, on the Y axis. And the product usually goes through an introduction stage and a growth stage, a maturity stage and a decline stage. And very often, not always, but very often um, the product in the BCG matrix fits to this product life cycle. So at the very beginning of the introduction phase, products are typically question marks and we don't know yet where the journey is going. We see high growth, but we are also relatively small compared to competitors. Then once we gain in scale, then the product becomes a star. And um, eventually as the growth subsides, it moves towards a cash cow. And um, in the end, if the demand is really uh, slowing down, it might move to a, a dog stage or maybe a, a bigger competitor enters the market and, and beats us in terms of scale, then the product might move to a dog stage. Now, this relationship between the product portfolio category and the, the um, stage of the product life cycle is a possibility, but it's not a given. So it's, it's not for granted that it always has to be like this. Finally, I would like to look at what does the stock market say about diversification strategies. And um, actually, the stock market does not like diversification so much, particularly if it's a conglomerate diversification, so meaning unrelated businesses. In the stock market, there's a so-called conglomerate discount, and that is roughly based on research of 20%. So what does it mean? If you add up the value of the businesses one by one, um, you, the sum of the parts gives you 100%, then the stock market value of the conglomerate of those different businesses is actually quite significantly lower, about 20% lower, at, at sitting at around 80% of the actual possible value. Now, some reasons, and these are my, my personal opinions. Um, for one, I believe that many investors are actually aware of the complexity that comes with managing these conglomerates. Management time is spread very thin on each of the businesses, and therefore it doesn't get each of the businesses doesn't get enough management time, and therefore investors believe that the business is not managed to the optimum. And as the stock price depends on the perception of the investors, um, that is reflected in the price. So that's one potential reason. Another reason that I learned during my time when I was um, in investor relations, analysts always want to build a model. They, they're building a model to try to evaluate or value your business. And when the business gets too complex with too many different business units, then they struggle to build a comprehensive financial model. And therefore they assign a discount to their valuations simple be simply because they cannot be so sure of uh, what the actual value creation will be in the future for each of the business unit and therefore they discount something to be on the safe side and the third is there might actually be actual diseconomies of scale where a conglomerate becomes so big and so complicated and so complex that actually um, the, the economies of scale subside and maybe turn into negative. And if you would split up the company, then those 
these economies of scale would actually disappear. So interesting to see that the stock market does not value diversification. So this brings us to the end of this session. In the next session, we will look at a little bit deeper level into mergers and acquisition strategies.